Hi, I'm Brandon Yonner. I'm the CTO of Maloka. Maloka is a VR mindfulness game. I come from a traditional tech startup background. I've been the founder or early pre-launch employee at multiple startups um, through scaling them. And this talk is going to present some learnings coming from that startup background into gaming and uh, just some um, experiences I've had building Maloka in more of a live ops fashion. Maloka is, we think of it as an ecosystem a little bit. So we have a uh, core game loop that involves self-expression on the island. You can customize your island. You can customize your uh, avatar, we call the spirit companion. And then we have a big content engine where we have mindfulness leaders providing content for us in the form of um, immersive meditations. So we partnered with Deepak Chopra, Sharon Salzberg, some of the big uh, mindfulness leaders in the space. So uh, the spirit companion is the, you're sort of, uh, you're able to interact with them. They're kind of your, uh, your personal incarnation on the island in a sense. Uh, so it's another way that we are enabling self-expression throughout the game. And then we also have a, a mobile app that we allow you to access meditation on the go. Um, we put meditation on social media. Um, so it's a whole uh, experience that we want to bring people who haven't meditated before into meditation or bring people into VR to sort of uh, use the some of the positive benefits there to help them build a meditation practice. Uh, let's go ahead and launch the trailer for Maloka. Welcome. I'm over here. The universe. The beginning and the endless. Now, I know why you're here. But do you? You're looking for answers. Deep down, you already know them. There are hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. And within you? Endless worlds waiting to be explored. Get ready to discover new possibilities, new realities, a new you. Starting right now. You and your spirit are now one. And the journey of a lifetime begins. Cool. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what uh, Maloka is and um, kind of what it look and feel and everything. Uh, so the topics I'm going to cover, I want to walk through the software development process that I normally use and I've kind of built up over the years of uh, building startups, trying to find product market fit, um, trying to scale them and I'll talk about how I've adjusted it for VR and uh, Maloka specifically. This is a little uh, graph I like to show of what it's like to build a startup. I think Paul Graham um, uh, initially kicked this off and it really shows uh, there is a period in here called the trough of sorrow, which I've spent way too much of my career in, but um, it is where you're kind of experimenting and uh, trying to find product market fit. And this actually uh, being in that trough of sorrow has produced most of the learnings throughout my career, um, experimenting, pivoting, uh, trying to figure out what's working. Uh, so it's very exciting once you actually find product market fit and kind of get through that. So the software development lifecycle generally that I like to use, um, I credit it to Basecamp's Shape Up book, but they uh, sort of advocate six week cycles and I've found it really works well for me. Uh, six week cycle is a little bit more of a natural progression versus sprint, sprint, sprint. Um, I think that the, what, what I'll normally do is a one week warm up and then two two week sprints and a one week cool down at the end. The warm up is really where I'm finding uh, the whole team comes in to help scope the feature and uh, kind of build requirements up and figure out what's feasible. And then we have two two-week sprints. 
which are really focused on producing shippable work. And we'll kind of uh, talk about what that means a little bit later in the talk. And then the cool down is a time to focus on stability, help QA out, and make sure that this is something great that we're going to be able to um, be happy about after the cycle. Just a little graphic again from the Shape Up book of what the progression looks like. So hopefully by the end here, you're feeling really good about your six weeks and what you what you've got done. Um, and at the beginning there, it's kind of an exciting time trying to figure out what we can accomplish in six weeks. The we'll go through some lessons learned, bringing this into VR and gaming. Um, I the goal here is to minimize tech and design risk because we don't know everything and we don't want to say we know everything. So uh, these are some strategies to mitigate that. First of all, and maybe the most important is scoping features. It can be really tempting to just build the most awesome thing you can think of, uh, but those tend to uh, create these large feature branches that stay out, outstanding forever and are difficult to maintain. What I like to focus on is scoping something that is achievable in a two-week sprint. Um, and it could be even multiple things. Maybe it's as simple as just adding a tooltip or some voiceover. Um, but it also does not, when we talk about shipped, I like to redefine what I mean by shipped in that we don't need to ship a full feature that could go to the end user. It could just be um, something that we can merge. So what can we merge in two weeks that will not, um, that will sort of help advance the game? Uh, and then another key thing here is that uh, as we're able to merge these things, it's great to be able to get them into the headset or the app so we can get quick feedback from all the stakeholders and more valuable feedback in my opinion. Uh, quick graphic, this is from GitFlow uh, to Jira, but basically uh, I think it illustrates a good uh, mindset of Let's pull a lot of feature branches, but let's merge them back in really frequently. And we don't necessarily have to, I, I assume this is probably uh, best practice across uh, most of your companies, but it's super valuable for us to maintain uh, a strong uh, culture of merging quickly and keeping develop up to, break, up to date with everybody else's changes. And even if we don't feel something is, if we feel like something's gonna interfere with other features or other development, sometimes we'll just put a feature flag in front of it so that it's still merged and we don't have to, the code is still there, um, but it maybe isn't interfering with our UX. I love this Git merge graphic. <laughs> I don't know why this cracks me up so much. Uh, I think it's the guy at the end falling down, but uh, I've had so many difficult merge conflicts in my career and um, we've seen some really tough ones in Unity, um, coming, especially coming from uh, less asset-heavy environments. Uh, this is, uh, I, th I think the frequent merges really <laughs> save a lot of headaches. Um, so another uh, lesson learned, I've always sort of uh, strove to have cross-functional teams. In gaming, it's actually been more difficult because there are so many different job functions. There's not just one designer. There's a lot, lots of different artists, um, different specialties with that within Unity and even on the server side and everything. So it takes a lot of focus I've found to really enforce this cross-functional team, but we wanna make sure everybody has, we know everybody has valuable feedback. We wanna empower them to uh, make this game as great as we can. So I like to think of it as collaboration over a relay race. So we're not just, developing the art and handing it off. Um, we're not just finishing the feature and handing it off to QA. We're actually bringing QA in to help plan. We're uh, making sure that the artists have uh, approval after the feature is developed. So this is what we intended to build and we're getting it out. One key point for me, I've always been, I, I've, I've been a full stack engineer for most of my career. I've done some machine learning. I've always been kind of focused on the data um, and it's been a little bit different in gaming because I've found that there's uh, data in many different places in many different ways. And what, uh, what we've seen value in is defining the data model early rather than as an afterthought. So really um, 
and I'll show some examples of this, but uh, thinking about how we want to store the data and what questions we want the data to answer early on in building the feature versus uh, maybe doing like a U building UI UX, starting to implement it in Unity, and then uh, figuring out what we're actually going to store in the database. Um, there's some other uh, interesting parallels here in that we've had some difficulty with uh, QA development. Uh, we've been trying to do some automated testing. Some of those things uh, are made a lot easier the more we have modularized abstracted data. Uh, this is not intended to be read, but just a simple example of my uh, data model planning. Uh, I know the text is very small here, uh, but what I'm showing here is that a, we have a user model, we have a meditation model, and then we have a join table of them experiencing them. So a user experiences a meditation. And some of these things that just typing out the data model, it sort of starts to establish a shared language. It shows what data each of these stores. And then from that, we can sort of extrapolate what we know about the gameplay. And that tends to, for us at least, make some UI elements very obvious, like um, because we have a date of the meditation and the users, um, how many meditations they've had, we can start to show what uh, what's their current streak or what um, is their favorite meditation type. We can also know what are some meditations they haven't tried yet. Uh, and then from the analytics angle for sort of overall company analysis, we can start to learn what are the top meditations what meditations do people return to or what gameplay access, like what gameplay areas are their favorites. Whenever I'm designing a feature, I really, um, especially when I'm prioritizing features, because again, there's so much to build and it can be really exciting and fun to think about things that we could build into the game. I like to think about things from a success metric perspective of like what feature can I define a, a great success metric for? So what am I really trying to do here uh, from, Im from improving the game for our users, improving um, our users' mindfulness while playing the game and enjoyment of that? So um, an example of a success metric here is I want people to meditate more consistently or enter the game more consistently. And so we kind of, uh, we're looking at this and we just have this problem. And I think maybe it's consistent across VR that people don't always want to put their headset on every day or they don't think to. Uh, so we built this feature called programs where you have a seven day program and you're sort of encouraged to return daily and get rewards afterwards. And um, I'll admit this data is a little cherry picked, but you can see that uh, our, our we got a much smoother um, engagement curve on our meditations once uh, we implemented this this programs feature. So it really did build much more of a daily habit. I'll pause for laughs here. Okay, so um, this is an example of the island for a new user. And I'm gonna jump to the next slide. It's an example of an island that is fully fleshed out for our power users. So this is, uh, you can, as you uh, meditate and take actions, you kind of earn rewards and you're able to plant, plant them on the island. Um, one point I wanted to make here, especially with modularized data, is that we really struggled because we would, let's say, onboard a new developer. and that developer would have this uh, blank island with not access to all of our content, et cetera. Um, and they're, maybe they're working on something like performance. Well, performance is going to be great here. But in this island, which is maybe like, let's say it's one of our QA users, they're reporting terrible performance. So um, we've really modularized our data in a way that we want to be able to jump between game states easily. I think it's a benefit to, to abstracting your data correctly. Something that I've done at traditional startups where I've had what's called like a seed data file and I can run automated tests off this seed data or put the application state into various places to easily develop new features that are relevant to those places. Um, so just another thing to think about when building data, I think this has been useful for us. Uh, again, because I've spent so much of my time in Trophosaro trying to find product market fit, I'm really focused on analytics because that is how I get an overall view of any startup that I'm running is how do I know if we're being successful and if 
the um, if we're getting closer to that product market fit. So one key thing is finding a North Star metric has always been very clarifying for me. Um, that North Star metric should lead to product market fit or um, happy gamers users. Uh, for us, when we were early on, we just had content for the most part in the game. So our North Star metric was total meditations. Uh, we've kind of moved towards uh, increasing median session time per user because we really want people to spend more time being mindful, uh, enjoy the game more and have more options in here. So it really helps us to have that metric to evaluate all of our features. Um, we can kind of ask the question, is this feature enhancing our core game loop, which should drive an increase in median session time? Also, uh, I, it's, it can be difficult to cohort users because um, we're delivering in a live ops fashion. So we're maybe pushing out new features and older or more uh, established users aren't using it as much. They've already kind of built their habits. So to learn if this feature was a success or not, we really want to cohort our users. Um, we also want to make sure that the, when we're evaluating uh, <clears throat> something further on in the game progression, that the users that we're evaluating the popularity of it with that actually have all of those features. It's been fun trying to find creative ways to cohort users and, and kind of reassuring ourselves that what we're doing is working. Um, so I'm calling this a little bit more of a data-driven development. I, I know that means different things, but uh, the benefits that we've seen to sort of focusing on the data are that uh, we, it seems like there's a tendency, I mean, I think this is maybe throughout all of software development, but um, it can be very tempting to create large global objects that store all of your data. Um, it can be tough to stick to like solid design principles or maybe uh, more functional designs. Um, and what we really like to do is uh, have a separation of concerns. So like each scene is its own thing. There's less dependencies. It makes it a lot easier to, to kind of build on new functionality. Um, so I think really focusing on modularized data can uh, accomplish that a lot. And maybe there's a caveat here in that we are uh, we are a online game. So there's a little bit difference here. For us, network requests are relatively cheap. Um, we're in VR. I think most people use VR when they have internet. So uh, we're a little bit less concerned with offline access. Um, but that being said, uh, I like having more network requests rather than uh, just uh, one giant uh, state. Um, and then we also have the companion mobile app, which uh, when we implement things, we had an initial tendency to kind of uh, put them, we have separate repos for the mobile app and for the VR game. And uh, the more that we can move things like metadata to the server side, the better it's been for us. And it also it kind of enables us to migrate data or um, put out like a V2 of a existing feature. Uh, more easily. And we've just found just generally faster iteration with this approach. And then also, um, I kind of talked about this earlier, but uh, the analytics kind of become self-evident and we are able to track a lot more analytically. Another thing, this has been a big learning is that uh, in gaming, uh, in Maloka specifically, we've had a really hard time doing quality QA. It's a very time consuming activity. And I think it's super important. Um, we have above four-star reviews and we want to keep it that way. And we uh, really care about our users having a mindful experience so we don't want a bunch of bugs popping up. So um, we've kind of tried to make QA a lot more efficient. So one thing we're doing is we are um, informing QA of all changes. So every time a merge is created, we want, to, we want QA to know about that. And we want them to have sort of a change log slash release notes. Um, good commit messages can be really helpful here where uh, that doesn't have to be something that's done as a secondary function. It can just sort of generate itself. Uh, we really like to embed QA rather than treating it as a downstream function. Because oftentimes QA can be the, the segment that knows your game the best. They've spent the most time in game testing things out. So I think there's a lot of value in uh, bringing them in the planning process as part of the cross-functional teams. This, the way we like to think about it is that every uh, as we're merging things in, as we're completing sprints, these things are tested in real time. So then when we go to cut a release, we actually have just one final QA pass of the overall game, but we do have confidence that each individual thing has already been tested. Uh, been super valuable for us just in the sense of 
um, being able to release more frequently because we're a content driven game. We want to get more content in people's hands. So being able to release more regularly has been super valuable for us. Another pain point, a little bit logging and observability. Uh, it's sort of a function of like when QA finds a bug, how do we reproduce that bug? How do we fix that bug? Um, but in VR, we found this especially difficult because there's new users who are doing all kinds of wild things. I mean, users everywhere are always doing all kinds of wild things, but uh, there's less established maybe gestures or conventions in VR. People are coming into it for the first time, unfamiliar with it. Um, and there's been a lot of weird issues that we've had that we don't want to spend days trying to reproduce or track down. So what we've done that we found uh, to be useful, and, and there's a lot of different solutions for this. Maybe it doesn't work best for you. I know Unity has its own uh, great solutions for monitoring logs, but we actually send all of our client-side logs to the server so we can unify those. So we actually have full context of what happens, especially, and this is great for QA because QA reports an issue. We can see what their game state is. We can see client-side, server-side, everything that's happening, uh, but a lot easier to uh, track down and fix these issues. Um, then we also will like to kind of add any sort of observability there. So uh, we'll have custom events that we're firing off. Um, it helps us get a picture of how everything is functioning from an overall game state. It's been, uh, I've built things like SaaS companies in the past where the users are relying on the software for their day to day function. They'll be very loud and clear when there's a bug um, or a feature request that they need to build out. They'll jump on a Zoom call with me, no problem. Um, in Maloka, we have great power users that will notify us of issues, but there's not a lot of context around that. And sometimes we don't even have uh, an email address or anything to track down the user uh, to actually look at any of this information. So we uh, we need to be reliant on our not only our QA, but just our logging, particularly in our staging environment, to be able to find any of these issues and make sure that we've uh, really gotten a good picture of what the game, how the game is working, and we can fix these issues really quickly without needing to rely on users to communicate what the issue is to us. We, again, thinking about Maloka as an ecosystem, we also really value our users. We really um, think that we want to build a user-driven experience. So we prioritize reaching out to our users and building communities. We have a Facebook group that's very active. We have a Discord. Um, we have these social accounts. And we put out free content across all. We engage with our users. We've done long-form user interviews with um, power users, especially, and just sort of gotten their feedback on what they would like to see. How has this helped us? We've gotten some, heard some amazing things uh, from our users. In fact, just the other day, uh, one of our users said that the stretch stone had helped them with their back pain that they've been uh, struggling with for years. It's just kind of amazing to hear these things and it's very validating. Uh, and so not only sharing those with the team is very valuable um, for, I feel like for my morale personally, but also it gives us a lot of super valuable feedback that we wouldn't otherwise get. Um, so we'll, we'll actively engage with our users and provide them with uh, surveys where they can provide us feedback. Uh, and we have a community manager who's managing all this. And then we like to put our content out. We're hosting daily meditation on Discord. Uh, we lo love to put our content out there because we have great content. We're not trying to be precious about it. Here's an example of a poll that we put on our Facebook group. Uh, very valuable feedback, just sort of showing what people, what we're doing is that's working. Um, an interesting thing here is that there's a lot of people who engage with this stretch stone for the first time uh, and then maybe don't return to it. So uh, we're thinking that maybe there's some ways that we can improve the content within there because uh, it is something that's desirable for people. Um, but we've had amazing, amazing feedback on our meditate our immersive meditation experiences and this has been a great way to get some of that feedback elicit that and get some thoughts from users and then here's just some from our, our instagram we'll put out some free meditation content free mindfulness content uh, put out some quotes from people and uh again just building engagement around loca as a whole especially because not a lot of people have vr but a lot of people do want that mindfulness kind of gaming uh sort of a break from the stress of everyday life. 
So we really want to bring that to people being a more mission driven company than just sort of a, um, you know, uh, game that's trying to optimize revenue. So we have, really have a mission to make to help non meditators meditate, help people just get a break from, uh, from the stress of daily life. Um, cool. So, uh, got some takeaways here. I hope this is helpful. I'm really coming from like a lean startup background. So I think you'll see a lot. I mean, I'm sure you've heard a lot of focus on getting things into users' hands, providing value as fast as possible. Uh, I don't know how helpful that's going to be for everybody, but hopefully this serves as maybe some reminders uh, of some things that you can do or just some quick ideas for ways to um, maybe tweak processes a little bit to uh, to kind of bring some traditional tech startup ideas into gaming or into Unity. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, my name is Brandon. Uh, please check out Maloka. Uh, would love for uh, you to reach out in any way possible. Thank you.